On this episode of Locked On Angels, it's Fan Mail Friday, and you asked, if the Angels org isn't doing things right, which organization should we look to? Which organization is doing some things right? We're going to share our thoughts on that and so much more. It's time to get Locked On with Mike and John, and this is Locked On Angels. You are Locked On Angels, your daily Los Angeles Angels podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Angels your first listen of the day. You can find us anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SiriusXM by searching Locked On Angels. And if you'd like to get back to the Super Halo Bros for all the Super Halo content, here's some things that you can do. Leave us a rate and a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not subscribed already, what are you waiting for? Time to subscribe and become a Locked On Everydayer. And whether you're watching or listening, come over to YouTube, leave a comment. It's one of the best ways to get in touch with John and I and be a part of the conversation. And today's episode of Lockdown Angels is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through Sunday, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Happy Friday to you, and thanks for being here for this Fan Mail Friday edition of Lockdown Angels, where it's your team every day. You've got the Frisch Brothers here with you, a.k.a. the Super Halo Bros. My name is John, and that's my brother Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother John. Hey, we love answering your questions every Friday. If you're wondering, where's the recap of last night's Angels-Astros game? Well, we'll get to the whole series on Monday. We'll talk about all four games. Look, I don't want to know what happened with Jose Suarez starting on the mound. And and quite frankly, we'll talk about it on Monday, Mike. And 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 I know people are probably in the future seeing this episode. They know what happened. Just leave me out of it. I just want to stay out of it. I don't, I don't want any part of it. Uh, but on today's show, we are getting to your questions. And again, we'll recap on, fr- on Monday everything that happened over the weekend. Mike, this first question uh, is having to do with which organization – is doing it right. And Ryan sent us a DM on Twitter, and I wanted to spend some time in the first segment answering this one. He starts out, hey guys, big fan here and every day. I've never messaged before, but every morning while dropping off my kiddo at school, it's a ritual for us to say the overlay, your intro. My son is John and I'm his brother, Mike. And if we don't sync up or we miss it, we have to rewind. And do it again. So thanks for making our weekday mornings. I love that. Um, Anyway, he said the news about Tyler Glass now with him being out for the season. I was listening to the fan responses on Dodgers Nation Live. Got me thinking. Dodger fans are upset with the team's training staff, complaining about the front office's transparency with injuries, criticizing the misuse of the bullpen and the roster by Dave Roberts. All of this sounds so familiar, doesn't it, Mike? <laughs> yeah. They're looking to place blame, which sounds familiar to what we hear on our side uh, down the highway as fans. You've mentioned it many times. It's easy to easy to overlook the human element behind the massive machine of major sports when engaging with the fan, fandom. He said, uh, "the the real issue." The D Mac, the host of Dodger Nation, said, "The real issue with Dodgers over the years is that they the front office and roster have prioritized players with impressive stuff. So they're worried about Tyler Glass now and his injury, and he's got great stuff and what he does with his elbow and how he throws his pitches. This had me wondering." about the Angels. How much of the injury issues fall on Perry, Artie, previous GMs for assembling rosters that are, for lack of a better word, injury prone? For example, one could argue that the lackluster rosters being built around Trout over the years have put additional pressure on Trout to perform out of his mind, resulting in in more wear and tear kind of injuries. Does a more balanced team equal a less injury prone roster? like innings eaters mixed with strikeout guys mixed with a balanced lineup at the plate. They can produce varying forms of contact speed up and down. Are there any nerd stats to justify this take? (laughs) Additionally, if Dodger fans are complaining about their front offices, transparency, transparency and team infrastructure, considering their investments in modern technology and players, are there any teams out there Mm. doing it right? Could we as angel fans look to another team's approach as a model our front office in terms of communicating with their fans, or is it just a widespread MLB issue that results in fans throwing frustrations at the wall? All this considering a team like the Dodgers who did nearly every fan pleasing move they could this past off season. Ain't that the truth yep. now have a fan base that echoes the same things we angel fans have been saying for years about our team. I know it's a bit long, but I thought I'd share my thought with you guys. Love everything you do. Thanks Ryan. Mike, there's, 
three parts to this question. Why don't you break it down for us? Yeah. So uh, like uh, Angel fans, Dodger fans are upset with the training staff, the lack of transparency, Dave Roberts managing, all of that. And the second piece was, does the lackluster roster put more pressure on guys like Mike Trout because of of his injuries? Like, does he need to try to perform out of his mind because the other guys aren't that great? And if all of us fans are complaining about our front office, then which team is actually doing it right? John, can I just give a quick thought here? Please, please. Dodger fans, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. And quite honestly, I it, being a fan is a what have you done for me lately? And the Dodgers are in a season of a lot of victories over the last 10, 15 years, right? Like they have been able to experience a lot of success, not in the playoffs, but in the regular season. I mm -hmm. and I are Niner fans on the football side and having a great team is a whole lot of fun to root for. But when they get to the playoffs and they don't succeed, that can be frustrating. However, you have no idea, Dodger fans, how good you have it. You have <laughs> no idea. And so it's fascinating to me that they're picking apart the structure of the organization when, as this everydayer said, the Dodgers did every fan-pleasing thing this offseason. And the reality is, is you're dealing with the human element of baseball players playing 162 games plus, right? Because the Dodgers have spring training and they have playoffs that they've been in. And John, with some of these signings, like Tyler Glass now, why are you surprised mm. that an injury-prone Tyler Gl Glass now has an injury? Mm -hmm. Why are you surprised by that, right? That's the risk that you take when you sign a guy like that, you trade for a guy like that. And that's something that you have to be aware of and almost anticipate that there's going to be a moment this season where Tyler Glass now is going to miss a few starts and maybe even miss a good chunk of starts like he is right now. Yeah. Missing the rest of the season, not going to be able to pitch in the postseason, nothing like that, Mike. And so now they're at a point where they're kind of inquiring, is Otani going to be able to pitch? And right. it's funny, my, my uh, chiropractor is a big Dodger fan. So we talk baseball all the time. And he said, look, you knew coming into the season, that Otani wasn't going to pitch for you. And now you're asking if he's going to pitch in the postseason. You were, you should have, or you were prepared to do this without him. Therefore, you can't expect to do this with him. Yeah. Considering, yeah, who knows how he's feeling or how he's going to pitch. So I think it's intriguing that that's where this conversation has gone with Otani because he's, right. he's the unicorn. He does all that stuff. But to bring it back to Angel stuff, it is funny to me that. As fans, we complain about all of the same things. We just got done talking about transparency with injuries and whatnot and how frustrating mm -hmm. that can that can be. And so to me, it's like, man, you can admire the Dodgers development system. You can admire what they're doing in Atlanta. You can admire the way that the Rays seem to be able to keep putting out playoff teams at a really low cost because their development is so strong. I know the Rays are not going to make the playoffs this year. They had a lot of injuries as well. And so I, I look around the league. I look at Atlanta and I look at their offense this year and the injuries they've dealt with, but also what the heck happened to Matt Olson, right? Yeah. And and so it's it's real baseball problems that pop up everywhere. And no matter how many safeguards you think you put around it, there's life finds a way, mm. right? And, yeah. and I think that's kind of how it goes in baseball sometimes, Mike, I look at, I look at O2 and for as much as we admire that team, they got hot at the right time. Didn't yeah, they? They, they just, did. they tore it up on the way to the end and, and got hot at the exact right time, got into the wild card and, yeah. and there you go. And that's kind of how I feel when it comes to baseball is you can't control some things. Things right. are going to happen. Right. And I think the angels in O2 got the right teams to play. They got yeah, to they got fair. to play some teams that hey the twins are in okay cool yeah fair. I think that's really what it boiled down to as well so there's some luck to this there's some um you know there's some talent obviously involved in this some strategy involved in this John when I think about like teams that are doing it well and if the Dodgers are not on that list then we're then nobody's doing it well because the Dodgers are doing it well right uh, I did see a tweet yesterday from Jeff Passan and he talked about how the Milwaukee Brewers are a really good organization that they are actually doing some really good things really well. And I wonder if it's 
because of who was there or who is there right now. Remember, mm -hmm. their guy did leave and he went to the, the Mets, Cubs. correct? Or the uh, Cubs. Yeah. Well, okay. So you've got their GM left and went to the Mets. Yes. Then Craig Council went to the Cubs. Yeah. And and here, you know, the, the Brewers are already clinched a playoff spot. Right. Right. <laughs> and so I, I wonder if it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years. If that was previous administration that helped them get to a place of health or if it's current administration that is right now got a great strategy. And so it's, you know, wait and see. Right. And I think the same is true of Perry Manassian now that he has a couple of years under his belt, but also has a couple of years in front of him. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 25 and in 26. We can fully evaluate that guy in a really specific stat driven way, because now we have history and it, he can't blame like past stuff or past drafts right. because all of this is his and he's going into those years now where it's his team, his fingerprints, his leadership. And so now he's the one that's going to be accountable for all this. Bringing this back to the question of if there's a lackluster roster around Mike Trout, does that put more pressure on him to perform one, but also does that result in more injuries? And I have to say that, if you go back one year to 2023, that was probably the most complete roster that the Angels have had in some time. Yeah. Obviously, something was going right, considering they weren't that far out of a playoff spot when they made the trades that they made. They were really trying to get there. They still had Shohei Otani. He was healthy. He was pitching. He was hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the injury still happened to Trout, the hamate bone. And I don't think you can control that kind of stuff. In previous years, maybe you could make a case for that. But I will say that last year felt like the most complete major league ready team, right? Yeah. And and even though they did deal with tons of injuries, Gio Urshela and and everything like that, and Anthony Rendon, as always, they, they still found a way to, to be in it. Then they made trades, and then they completely fell off. Mm -hmm. Of course, Trout was injured by that point. So I, I don't know that there's much to... Trout getting injured more because he's trying to make up for the mediocrity yeah, yeah. of this team. I will say that coming into this season, I mean, look, I, I know they got off to a rough start, but they seem to have found their footing early on. And then Trout was hurt again, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I would bet, Mike, that if you put Trout with this team, all the all the boats rise, right? All the yeah, the, sure. the trout tide lifts all the boats up. Because it feels like now they have a picture of a young team, yeah, but a complete team. I know that there's tons of questions to answer going into the offseason, but it doesn't feel like it's a stars and scrubs lineup as it was in 21, right, right. 22, and yeah. part of 23, right? I think it feels a little bit different. I think that the, the issue isn't going to necessarily be that Trout is going to try to stay healthy because he's really pressing. I think the issue is going to show up in his stats. And so far, his stats haven't been terrible, especially when he came back and he hit 40 bombs in that one season. Was that 22 mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. he came back, right? And even this year, I know his stat line doesn't look fantastic, but he was hitting some home runs. Wasn't knocking in too many people because there wasn't too many people on base. Mm -hmm. And his batting average was low, but Trout has got that notorious slow starting syndrome that – Pujols had and everybody who seems to come to the Angels has. And so if you give him enough at bats, I'm, I'm sure that that would shift. That's where I think you would start to see maybe him feeling the pressure and the stats would really be struggling. And so that'll be important to pay attention to next season. Although to your point, I think this team is a much better team than they've been in a really long time. Hey, thanks for making Lockdown Angels your first listen of the day. The Angels are playing the Astros again, 5, 10 Pacific time. You can catch every pitch of the Angels hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Angels. Coming up on Lockdown Angels, what's it going to take for Artie Marino to change his approach? Most losses in team history, get embarrassed by this team. We'll share your thoughts and our responses coming right up. Today's episode of Locked On Angels is brought to you by eBay Motors. If you're working on your car, ebaymotors.com has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and even level it up to peak performance. They've got superchargers and roof racks and exhaust kits and LED headlights and so much more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered with over 122 million parts for your auto. 
you'll find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guarantee Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every single time or you're going to get your money back. With all the parts that you need at the prices that you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your car or your truck or your SUV alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay Guarantee Fit is only available to U.S. customers. This is the Lockdown Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And every dayers, don't forget, it's coming up quick. The Ohapi All-Star Bowl, October 5th, Saturday at Cal Bowl in Lakewood. We're putting on this event. Logan Ohapi is putting on this event to raise money for Corey's Promise, a nonprofit organization that really is something that is doing something special for families whose children are dealing with pediatric cancer. They help offset the financial burden that comes along with that. They walk alongside these families. And so Ohapi and his teammates are putting on this event. They're so excited. We're excited. We're going to be there. We're going to be bowling together. We're going to be bowling against some of the angels. There will be times to, to meet the players, all that great stuff. We're super excited. Mike and I are bringing some merch with us as well, some Super Halo Bros merch. If you'd like to go, you can grab your tickets in the episode description. And when you get your ticket, use our promo code BROS, B-R-O-S, at checkout, and you can get $50 off your ticket. We're super honored to be part of this event. We can't wait to see you there. So everydayers, show up and show out for the Ohapi All-Star Bowl. It's Fan Mail Friday. Johnny, let's go to the voicemail line and hear from Brett in San Antonio. Hey, Mike and John. This is Brett from San Antonio. Hello. Since we just played the White Sox, uh, I just read a fascinating article in The Athletic about meddling owner Jerry Reinsdorf, and I was wondering, what do you think it's going to take for owners like Moreno, Reinsdorf, John Fisher, and others who seem to meddle in clubs' activities and decision-making? What's it going to take for them to kind of have that aha moment? Um, you know, how many losing seasons – how many players leave and how tough it is to find these guys. I'm curious what you think it's going to take um, for them to finally turn things around. Love the show. Make it a great day. Talk to you soon. Later. Brett in San Antonio, thank you for your voicemail. Mike, I don't know if you saw the article from The Athletic, but it's called An Owner Who Thinks He Knows Everything <laughs> Led the White Sox to Historic disaster of course they're referring to jerry reinsdorf the owner of the chicago white Sox and the bulls also mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. so longtime owner of both franchises and just to give some information here man they interviewed a ton of people and and the takeaway i had mike was this is a guy who loves baseball so much but has such an old school this is how they used to play the game mm. mentality and doesn't that all sound all too familiar to you. Yeah, it does. And here's what's interesting about Reinsdorf, John, is that he had Jerry Krause as his general manager when the Bulls were the Bulls, when the mm -hmm. Bulls had Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, all of those guys, Tony Kukoc. And so the, the interesting thing is that at that time, he was on the cutting edge. Hmm. And the reason why he was on the cutting edge is because he hired the right guys. They even made a controversial move and went to Phil Jackson early in the in the late eighties, early nineties to get Phil Jackson as the head coach there, because that was a younger guy who had more of a philosophy of the triangle offense that would fit Michael and fit Scotty and those types of guys. I'm, I'm a Bulls fan. Yeah. So, uh, tell. <laughs> so the reason why I bring that up though, is because the, the question, like what will it take for these owners to dot, dot, dot Johnny, I, I don't know if it's going to be losses. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's going to be like the franchise isn't doing well. I think it's going to be bottom line dollars hmm. and these images online of like 14 people at the White Sox game when that happened not too long ago, or even one of our everydayers that went to the 13 inning game. Stephanie. Took yeah. Stephanie took photos. Right. And there was what? thousand people there like I mean, no, it was really Mike, small. it said 22,432 yes. or something that propaganda ridiculous. just keeps on going right but that's the thing is i think the bottom line is has got to be impacted and 
I, there's egos in this. Yeah, and so I think that time. it's going to be bottom line. And then I think number two is going to be, if these guys keep getting pooped on by the fans, if these <laughs> guys keep getting pooped on by the media, then I think that there's going to be a stirring of wanting to do something. The problem is for the Reinsdorfs and the Artie Morenos out there, the decisions that they make are not going to be decisions that are infrastructure decisions to make the team better. It'll be decisions like, okay, so let's sign that guy. And that'll mm -hmm. solve our problem, right? Hey, we need Trey Turner, right, Perry? Trey Turner, right? And that's <laughs> that's really what it boils down that to. That was good. These owners, do you like that? And so I think that it's it's going to be some of those things, but I still I still don't trust their decision making process until they give full control to the people that they've hired to do their job. And if they're not doing their job, then they need to find the right people to do their job. I think a lot of the problem is the people that they have hired to do the job, Mike, and, and not allowing them the ones like reading that story, the guys coming in who wanted to get the white Sox up to speed in terms of analytics and player development just hadn't had the permission to do that again. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. And, yeah. and it goes back to the angels where just this year, Bar Barry Enright said, Hey, how about we actually get some pitching labs and some hitting labs in Arizona at our spring training facility. How about you do the renovations you said you were going to do four years ago, right? Yeah. And and so to me, it, it boggles my mind. And and this is the comparison I'll make. You know, Stitch Fix has has sponsored our show in the past, and I make the joke that Mike, once you reach, once men reach age thirty, how they dress at age thirty is how they dress for the rest of their lives. And when I think about Reinsdorf and the fact that you know he hires Phil Jackson. That's his age 30 dressing for the rest of mm -hmm. his life. Oh, no, mm -hmm. it worked back then. Right. But, right. but why don't you hire today's Phil Jackson? Yeah. Who's forward thinking for some reason, they just can't make the connection of, Oh, maybe I need to hire that forward thinking person once again. Yeah. And yeah. Phil Jackson was great almost 40 years ago now. Yeah. And, uh, and now who, who is that in today's baseball? world and and that's what's missing that's the key ingredient and when i think about Artie marino and the team it comes back to let the baseball guys yeah. do baseball things also hire baseball guys yeah. to do baseball things because we talk about team president john carpino he has nothing to do with baseball other than payroll and who gets to do what and stuff right. like that he's he's not a he's not a president of baseball operations they fired perry's assistant gm probably for the better, but they never replaced him. Yeah. And they, you know, the, the fund, the funds for scouting and development, that's where you got to invest in. That's the infrastructure you got to invest in. And I just don't know that Artie Marino, people like Fisher and Reinsdorf are too forward thinking enough at this point to make those kinds of decisions. John Garrick's apprentice on YouTube said, am I a bad fan? No, you're not. I, no, am never. I a bad fan for wanting to see the angels re reach 96 losses? I get ah. standing by the team, but I really want Artie to own the label of pre presiding over the worst team in franchise history. He deserves it. First of all, you're not a bad fan. No, because not at all. I feel exactly as you feel. <laughs> do you? Interesting. I do. I, 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 now, does that impact him? Again, I, I don't know, John, but I do think like this, this narrative of we're going to get them, we're going to run down the West and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to compete. We're going to do that. Like, I love, I love the fact that they are, are well on their way to losing and I hate it for the guys and I hate it for us fans, but I do love the piece of like, you, you tried to fool us with this fool's gold. And we saw that long before you even said that you were going to try to fool us. And now you can't fool us because yeah. The record speaks for itself, Artie, and you were overseeing this. You were in charge of this. And what are you going to do about it? Because if you just keep doing the same thing, this is what's going to keep happening. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with the fact that it would be great to give Artie that label of, hey, you're the owner of the worst team in franchise history. Congratulations. I guess my pushback, and, and you said this earlier, I don't know if it... I don't know if it matters to them. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if it even, if he even cares. And I don't, at this point, I'm not sure it makes a difference either, Mike. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure that owning that label would make a difference. I think it's more damaging to Barry Manassian, Ron Washington, and Barry Enra, all those guys. I think mm. it's more damaging to them because the it's hard to see the nuance of 
hey, here's what these guys are helping these guys improve in. Yeah. But also, here's the results. And, yeah. and that's what we've tried to bring to the table all season long is here's where they're improving. We know the result sucks, but there's advancement here. And, and I think the nuance goes away with that if they own the worst record in franchise history. And I think Artie can just brush it off. Do you think Artie re-signing Perry is a glimmer of hope that he maybe is seeing some of that stuff? Yeah, I think so, because it's certainly different than what they've done the last 20 years. Sure. And I know sure. it's not 20 years, but but 15 years where it's a GM. Oh, he doesn't work. All right, get the next guy. Get the next guy. Get the yeah. next manager. Get the next guy some consistency. We talked about this when Perry got re-signed or or extended consistency, some cohesion, some continuity was the word that we've been using. And and I think it's so good to see some continuity for better, for worse. And again, if if a new GM came into the situation, it would have been rinse and repeat. And I think that now that there's some optimism about the young guys in the system, it's going to take some time, but I think that's, there's a lot worth looking forward to at this point. Everydayers, this weekend is your last opportunity to get a gift from FanDuel. They're America's number one sports book. And now through this Sunday, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket with YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch these regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market games whenever you want. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. So bet $5. And you're going to get free three weeks of NFL Sunday ticket. Get it right now. You got three more weeks. How awesome is that? It's from your friends at FanDuel. And you can get started at FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. Mike, we got a few more questions for Fan Mail Friday. And the first question comes from Jacob Kirkrup on Twitter. He sent us a DM. He said, hey, if you had your choice, how would you set up the outfield for the team next season? Hmm. Trout possibly moving to left field. Would you go with Adele in center field and Moniac in right? Would you try to sign another outfielder? Plus, you'd probably have to trade Ward this offseason as well. Thank you. All right, Mike. You're you're setting up our outfield. What's it look like next season? I'm going to really try to trade Ward, and I think I'm going to try yeah. to get an arm or something of value for Taylor Ward. So I'm going to have Trout. Adele and Moniac, and I'm going to go and see what I can do to get somebody like a Santander. I know that there were some fans that were like, yes. And other fans that were like, "Mm, that feels like a, should we sign another Anthony? Right. That doesn't, that doesn't coming off a career year. Yes. I, I, I get all of that, but I do think that this lineup needs another bat. And so I would try to set up this lineup with trout in left Santander in right. And I would have Joe Adele in center field. And then I would use that DH spot to rotate the outfield and more than likely I'm going to have trout in that DH spot. Mm -hmm. And somebody suggested trout needs to talk to his buddy Shohei. He's pretty good at that DH spot, right? I thought that was funny. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) If you need help getting into a DH routine, talk to Shohei and make it happen. Yeah. I think for me, it's, it's, you know, if that's the route that you go, I agree with that. Definitely trust Moniac in center field, regardless of how all of this shakes out, because I think he's earned that spot. So if trout moves to a corner, if he's DHing more, I think you're going to see Moniac in center field, just as we've seen all season long. And Adele's trustworthy out there too. He's yeah. played some center field, played a lot of it in the minor leagues, but right field seems to be his comfort zone. Yeah. There was a time where right field was a struggle for him and left field he was more comfortable in. And so before this season, I would have said, put Joe Adele in left. Yeah. But considering he's been one of the better defensive outfielders across MLB this season, which who saw that coming, right? right? Who saw that coming from Joe Adele this season? Wild, wild stuff. How about, uh, why don't you take us to our next question? Yeah. Good luck. Chuck 24 on YouTube said Nelson Rada. He had hype. saw he was stealing bases, but he seems small for major league baseball and lacks power. John, tell us about Nelson Rada. Yeah. You would ask, uh, Hey, anybody, is there anybody in the minor leagues that, you know, is catching your eye that we haven't talked about in a while considering we were talking about Rio Foster the other day. So Nelson Rada this year struggled in double a with a two thirty four average, a three thirty one on base, two sixty nine slugging and a 600 OPS. But here's the thing. Rada is a contact guy, mm-hmm. a speedster. He's bat first scouts. Do expect him to add some power considering he's only 19 years old, but they don't want him to add power at the expense 
of his speed. He's projected to be a top of the order kind of guy can stay in center field, play some good defense. Mike, here's the thing. He skipped high a tri city and went right from inland empire to double a rocket city. So Mm. he skipped an entire level. I know it's confusing. There's single a right high a double a triple a right. And that's not even mentioning, you know, Dominican summer league or rookie ball or anything like that. The results, the walk rate, went down from 2023. The strikeout rate went up at double A and he had a weighted runs creative plus of 87. So he was 13% lower than league average in double A. What is encouraging to me is the fact that his line drive percentage went up and that's his superpower, hitting the ball to all fields, making good contact, getting on base with speed. It's the strikeout rate. It's the strikeout rate, which was 23.3% this year that really hurt his average and his numbers across the board. Mike, did he get overmatched? Is it too much too soon for somebody who's 19 in double A? What do you say? No, continue to let him play there and continue to let him to develop. And that, I mean, he was great in, in Inland Empire. So you got to move him up to a, a different level. And and double A is kind of where Major League Baseball players develop, right? There's a player from early 90s from the Marlins. His name was Chuck Carr, there's a throwback. Chuck Carr was somebody that had uh, a, a pretty good batting average, not a lot of power, but could just fly all over the outfield and fly on the bases. Nelson Rada has some of Chuck Carr in him. Now, Carr didn't have a really long career. However, I think Rada is going to be a bit better, but it's going to take him some time to develop. Remember, 19 years old. Like, we'll probably see him in the majors at 22, 23. Mm-hmm. That's four years, three, four years from now. So that's going to give him a whole lot of experience, be able to build his body up to where he needs to be. I, I think that he, they just need to be really patient with him and not rush him. And then when he comes up, he could be a Chuck Carr, maybe a Sean Figgins as a batter for us. And I think that that would be a great benefit to the angels. So you'd keep him in triple a continue to work on the contact, get that strikeout rate down perhaps a year in triple a he's now used to the pitching and what he's going to see and, and what kind of pitches are coming his way, because that really seems to be when when you're in single a it's fastball changeup. Yeah. Right. And then as you move up to double a starting to see a slider, starting to see a curveball, maybe stuff like that, maybe a splitter or a sinker or something like that. And, and so I think the jump was a big jump for him. Sure. Now that he's got a year behind him, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he can do next season in double a hey thanks for making locked on angels your first listen of the day now for your second listen check out locked on mlb with our friend Sully. he's got you covered every single day on all things baseball and he's available on youtube or wherever you get your podcast part of the locked on podcast network where it's your team every day all right this weekend everybody make sure you give us a follow at locked on angels on twitter and at super halo bros on twitter and instagram because we're going to be watching the games against the astros the four game series we'll recap that on Monday, right, Mike? Yeah, we got all the details for you. We're going to watch closely at how the pitchers, how the catchers, how the outfielders, how the bullpen does. Right now, John, honestly, it's probably going to be more, how's the bullpen? Because some of our fun starters are not pitching anymore. Right. And that bullpen is looking good. And maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps we've got a bullpen for next year if each of these guys can come through. We might even need to do a whole segment on that next week. But join us on Monday as we recap the Astros weekend series against the Angels. All right, looking forward to that. We hope you have a great weekend. Until then, my name is John, and that's my brother, Mike. And my name is Mike, and that's my brother, John. Thanks for being here with us, everybody, and we'll see you back here on Monday. I think we should do a game called Name the Background Noises in Mike and John's Houses. (laughs) No kidding.